In this episode of This Week in Space, we visit with Dale Scran, Chief Operating Officer of the National Space Society, to talk about space for the rest of us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 26, recorded July 29th, 2022, released August 26th, 2022. Space for the rest of us. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the National Space Society edition. I'm Rod Pyle, editor-in-chief of Ad Astor Magazine, and I'm joined by the redoubtable Jeffrey Notkin, a fellow science writer, star of TV's hit Meteorite Men, and a governor of the National Space Society. Say hello, Jeffrey. Greetings, Captain Rod. Oh, we have an exciting show today, National Space Society special. I am thrilled. We do. And as former president, I'm sure you'll have some things to say. Today, we're going to be chatting with Dale Scran, a leader in the citizen space movement for decades and kind of my boss sometimes. I like to call him Dale the Hammer for his tireless effectiveness. <laughs> Hello, Dale, and welcome to the show. Well, glad to be here. And uh, the Hammer, eh? I prefer to I like call it, myself don't the, the Iron Fist in the Velvet Glove. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With, with I like the Hammer. All right. Uh, and Dale knows me, so he won't be surprised that I have some lame humor that I have no doubt he'll be completely outclassed by. I'll be outclassed by by my co-host, but here we go. Top five things to do in a space station. Roll down the window and throw beer cans passing Russian satellites. When the NASA camera is off, dance around to Blue Jean by Dave Bowie while wearing just your space helmet. Don't move, don't touch anything, and if you break something, know that you will be blamed mercilessly for us and shunned by society to a gulag in a remote part of northern Siberia in the Russian segment only. Or watch all of Polly Shore's movies and try and find examples of humor, plot, and reasoning for making it. That's it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Rod, isn't, okay, Jeffrey, isn't the, show me up. Isn't the David Bowie song is Gene Genie? Not Blue Jean. Uh, Right, Gene uh, Genie. I, I, we can't you know, sing it on the air because we have to pay royalties. My mo- knowledge of any music after 1939 is pretty embarrassing, so I'll, oh, okay. I'll have to go with, oh, no. with, with your point of view. All right, now I bet my, you this, have something. I have I, this week's space joke, especially for Dale. When <laughs> astronauts began to live permanently on the Moon, Mars, and the asteroids, they kept getting upset stomachs. But in the end, everything was okay because fortunately their flight surgeon had prescribed space settlements. <laughs> oh my God. Ooh. Oh, well done, so sir. Rapid. My hat's off. Why, thank you. <laughs> oh my God, that's wonderful. Another? I'm not sure. This is a contest I want to be in. <laughs> <laughs> Surely you have another, Jeff. Okay. Why was the first <laughs> Why was the first lunar hotel built next to the Mare Tranquillitatis? Mm. No idea. Why was it built next to Mare Tranquillitatis? Because the hotelier wanted all the best rooms to have ocean views for those space tourists. <laughs> okay, that, that's I a good idea. One. I, I like that. Okay, I like excellent. That. Thank you. You know, you know, uh, Rod. I was a little surprised that in your list of things to do in a space station, you didn't uh, mention bringing along your pocket drill and drilling holes in the <laughs> Russian modules. Ooh, that's a good point. Point one for Dale. All right. Okay. Let's move on to some headlines so we can get to the good stuff. Russia flies the coop. The newly installed chief of Roscosmos, Russia space agency, recently announced that his country will pull out of the International Space Station after 2024. After years of such threats, this appears to be the final word, maybe. The rationale given was that Western sanctions are destroying Russia's relationship with Western partners, unquote. Since the new Russian space chief, Yuri Borisov, does not appear to be as inflammatory as his predecessor so far, this time they may mean it, we'll see. Still undetermined is whether the Russians will seek to decouple their modules from the ISS, which depending on how you parse the cost, the U.S. has in fact mostly paid for, but we'll see. So that's that's news to keep your eye on. Hmm. Next up, comments on that, Rod. As you know, I've yes. travelled extensively in Russia, and I've 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 worked there, I've filmed there, and I've seen firsthand how how science can transcend political differences. And I, I've always believed in the importance of that. But 
given the current situation with the aggression in Ukraine, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can, I can stick with that. I'm not sure I consider it much of a loss. Do you think there's another, another potential partner that might come forward and, and help support the ISS along with the United States? Might well, be a question that's a for good, Dan, for Dale. Dale question, yeah. But yeah. in my well, personal well, opinion, they're they're not going to have much of a space program if they pull out. And their ideas of flying their own space station, as far as I know, they don't have any modules on the ground ready to go. And on their budget, which is well below two billion a year, or just over two billion a year now, I think it it's hard to imagine. But you never know; they may surprise us. Dale, I, I would say two things on this. It is possible that if they pulled out, I don't know, the Indians might step forward, or that the other existing partners might step forward, the Japanese, the Europeans. Um, the, the the thing though that I think people are, I don't know, a bit overly excited about this, in the sense that. The Russians have been saying they're going to pull out after 2024 right. for a while. And the, the key point or the, the key text, and you got to really parse the words, after 2024. didn't say when after. Mm. <laughs> okay. Like so 2029, the right? There, yeah, yeah, exactly. The thing is, we don't, there's really no new information in that announcement. That That's the point. And, yep, they've announced their intention of pulling out. But as you've so correctly pointed out, they don't really have a lot of money and they don't have a lot of modules. So they may want to, I don't know, put forward their strangely anachronized Ross space station. And uh, but when that's really going to happen, I don't know. I wouldn't hold my breath for, for seeing it happen. It's also worth mentioning that, you don't know, the U.S. Is, needs to do some work to live without them. But we now have the Cygnus module uh, reboosting right. the ISS. So that's a, a really positive development. All right, next up, look out below part two or three, depending on how you look at it. After a couple of uncontrolled reentries in 2020 and 21, China has once again launched a rocket stage that will fall back to Earth in an uncontrolled reentry landing who knows where. They're narrowing the uh, reentry zone, but we still don't know exactly where it's going to come down. The Long March 5 rocket lofted a new segment to the Chinese space station on July 4th. Apparently, the Chinese knew they would not be able to determine the point of reentry or the timing, seemingly playing the odds that the rather large upper, upper stage won't fall into a populated area, which is a good bet given that most of the orbit's over the ocean. But that's 21 tons of potential hurt flying overhead, so keep your eye on space.com for updates and keep looking up. And if you see a little incandescent white spot that isn't moving sideways, then you should start moving sideways because that means it's coming straight for you. Dale? Yeah, you know, I'm in my basement right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. Uh, yeah, that, I, I, I was thinking, it's a, it's a real issue. It's very unfortunate that the Chinese continue to irresponsibly launch second stages. You know, other folks have a much more responsible program or, or methodology of deorbiting the state, the second stages in a controlled way. And, uh, you know, they, they really have to stop doing this, but it's, they're not necessarily, uh, let's just say that our interests are not their top priority. Well, as the chief operating officer of the National Space Society, I suggest you have a chat with them and let them know what <laughs> needs to happen. Yeah, that's, uh, that, you know, I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've actually been to China on business and, it's an experience. Um, it's an experience. I, I think the point I'm trying to make is the Chinese are not known for listening to non-Chinese actors. Yeah, I've been there, I think, five times now, and I've, I've never once been solicited for my expert space information just once or twice for secrets about JPL, which I refuse to uh, discuss. Jeffrey, do you have any comments before we move on? I just think it's pretty reckless. These are more human-made meteorites that are going to land on Earth, and we've seen what happens when a when a tiny meteorite hits a car or a mailbox or goes right through the roof of somebody's house. And those are small, so twenty-one tons that could really do a lot of damage if it came down in the wrong place. Yeah, but what a collectible, huh? I was just going to say, I wonder uh, if there's going to be a market for recovered space flight, human-made meteorite debris fragments that have fallen. I, I wouldn't mind a piece yeah. of that in my office. If anyone, uh, if a piece of that lands in your yard, let me know. I might be interested. Just just rinse off those hypergolics first. All right. Please. Well, we'll be back to talk to Dale the Velvet Hammer Scran after this short message, <laughs> so stay with us. All right. 
Dale, tell us a little bit about your background and your current role at the National Space Society. And then I'm going to ask you what the NSS is for people who may not know. Well, okay. So I am a long, long time space geek. I, when I was a little kid, you know, I was one of those kids and I was born in 1958 and I grew up making scrapbooks of, I think I picked up near the end of Mercury and Gemini and, and then we didn't have a TV in those days. And my dad bought a TV so we could watch the moon landing uh, in 1969. So, you know, I was just really into it. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it, I guess the other thing that kind of shaped me is, of course, I read a lot of stuff, but uh, my mother took me to a lecture, a scientific lecture in Saginaw, Michigan, of all places. It's just near where I mm. grew up. And uh, Werner von Braun was making a tour, uh, talking wow. to the masses about the importance of space. And I don't, re frankly, remember a thing about what he said, although I probably <laughs> had a big impact on me. But I did yeah. get to shake his hand, and I do remember that. And um, obviously, he's a person of, uh, shall we say, ambiguous characteristics, but in some ways, probably one of the greatest engineers of the 20th century. And uh, someone that really contributed a great deal to our movement into space. So, you know, I got involved in the, I don't know, the, uh, the National Space Society in 05, probably like in college. And then I was pretty active in the late 80s. I was actually actually on the regional board of the National Space Society for a while. And I was the editor of the Space Activist Handbook for three years. I worked with, uh, I actually bundled money for Space Pack, and I did all kinds of stuff. I was the president of the North Jersey L5. Um, but then in 1998, I decided to go to work for a company called Ascend Communications, and I did startups until 2008. And uh, when you do startups, you know, you see your family like a couple hours a week, and you work. And uh, that's what I did for, for all that time. And uh, then I came up for air. And uh, I had founded a company called uh, CMware, which eventually went down the tubes. Uh, we raised eight million bucks, and we lost every penny. And mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was real money time, too. There's real money. Yeah, I was eight, eight million bucks is real money today. Um, so I, uh, you know, the day GM went bankrupt was the day the VCs pulled the plug, and I had to shut the company down. And so I had time on my hands. I went to the ISDC and there was this guy, guy talking, a uh, South African guy, Elon Musk. And I was like, wow, he's building a rocket. This guy is really different than anybody I'd ever seen before. Something is happening here. And uh, they, so I got back involved in the National Space Society and uh, started to uh, take on a series of, of national level roles. Um, so currently, I've held a bunch, a number of roles at the National Space Society. I've been the chair of the policy committee, which is the person who leads our legislative activities. Um, I, I, I also was the executive vice president, who's the person who appoints the chair of the policy committee. So I appointed myself. Um, but uh, later okay. on, I, I appointed the excellent Alfred Anzaldúa, who was a, a real find. And I, I, I know you both know Al, Al. Um, and. Uh, Anyways, then later on, uh, Bruce Pittman, who is our chief operating officer, retired or from retired from uh, NSS, and I took on his job. And you know, this is really the job I kind of feel the most comfortable with in some ways. I love politics, I love being politically active, but by profession, I'm a, a manager and uh, have a lot of experience managing technical stuff and hiring people and negotiating contracts and that kind of stuff. So I'm. I'm like the, the center point person in charge of NSS operationally. Well, and I just I just want to say one quick thing, which is let's bear in mind that you are a volunteer. And as far as I can tell, you put in about 60 to 70 hours a week doing that because <laughs> my wife would you're agree a true believer. <laughs> I am a true believer. Um, you know, I'm uh, blessed with uh, having some time to work on this stuff and a, and a wife who uh, has a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, um, you know, I do spend a lot of time on it. I, I do have some other things I'm doing, but um, most I do a lot. I spend a lot of time on NSS stuff. It's fun. It's like, uh, you know, as, as my wife says, I'm living the dream, right? It's the thing. It's my hobby. 
It's the thing I really like doing. It's exciting. And, and this is a wonderful time to be involved in space. It just, just to follow the news is amazing. It's every day, something amazing is happening. And part of, part of our mission as the National Space Society is to help uh, our listeners to understand what those things are. Because sadly, the, the, I hate to talk about the mainstream media, but the mainstream media has decided space is not interesting. And every once in a while, if somebody dies, you'll see an article or maybe the Hubble gets a nice picture that got some good publicity. But for every story you see, there are nine other stories that are probably more important for your life than the Hubble Space Telescope. But you're not hearing about them. Mm. This leads perfectly into a question I'd like to ask you, Dale. And and as a, f- a former president of the National Space Society, I have had the pleasure of working very closely with Dale, and I can also testify to his extraordinary devotion to the NSS and and to furthering support and education about spaceflight in general. And the National Space Society has had a rather glorious history. It was it traces its roots back to 1974. When it was when Werner von Braun founded the National Space Institute, and Dale, I did not know that you had met Werner von Braun. That was uh, that must have been a pivotal moment in your life as a space enthusiast. I, and then I think it my, was. Yeah. That's that's um, that's remarkable. And then in 1987, the National Space Institute, which von Braun founded, merged with the L5 Society to become the National Space Society, and the NSS is regarded as the world's largest citizens activism group for for the furthering of the ideal of establishing humanity as a permanent spacefaring civilization. Dale, would you like to to share a couple of success stories where you feel the NSS has has really shone, has has stood out and here's something we accomplished, here's some positive things that we've done to further the mission of spaceflight. Well, that's that's a tough question because there's actually a lot of things, most of which are not well known. Uh, so one thing, I'm going to mention three things that I think NSS has done that were profoundly important. One is, it's not well known, but the at one point the ISS uh, passed the funding for the National International Space Station fund that passed the U.S. Congress by a single vote. And the NSS was very involved in supporting the ISS at that time. And when you're winning something by a single vote, it's easy to imagine that you you did have some impact. Uh, so that would be one thing I'd point to as, of course, it's impossible to prove that NSS made a difference, but I think we did. Uh, another thing that that the L5 Society and later the NSS had a lot to do with was stopping the so-called Moon Treaty, which is really called by the lawyers the Moon Agreement. Um, I think it's pretty much dead now. We actually have a national space policy that, that the U.S. will not follow it or ratify it or base anything on it. And we're focused on the, the Artemis Accords, which are a much more favorable direction, which I could certainly talk more about. But th- that was a long fight. And uh, we have succeeded in basically making the Moon Treaty irrelevant and focusing people's attention on on better ways to develop resources in space. And then the the third thing, which I think is really not well known, is the National Space Society has been an outstanding incubator for space leaders. And I'm going to mention a few names that some of which you may or may not be familiar with. George Whitesides, who at one point was executive director of the National Space Society, uh, has held a variety of positions at NASA, and then he was the CEO of Virgin Galactic. So uh, obviously a leader at NASA and in uh, in new space. Uh, and then there was um, Scott Pace, who actually held uh, a long time ago my job at the National Space Society, executive vice president. Uh, he's a professor at uh, George Washington University, but he was in the previous administration, the executive secretary of the National Space Council, where he had an absolutely pivotal role in setting U.S. space policy. I've uh, known Scott for a long time. He's a great guy, and he's been a you know true asset, not just to the National Space Society, but to the entire country. And then, last but not least, Lori Garver. Uh, Deputy Administrator of NASA, she was 
Uh, she started incredibly as a secretary at the National Space uh, Institute, became the executive director of the National Space Society, um, you know, got, got graduate degrees in space policy, and then uh, became the, uh, as I say, the deputy director of NASA under Charles Bolden, and possibly had as much to do as any single human being with making commercial space successful. She valiantly supported commercial uh, commercial cargo and commercial crew against the forces of evil, and <laughs> she won through. And, uh, you know, she has a book out uh, now, I encourage you all to read, called Escaping Gravity. And I'm, I'm sure Rod, can, Rod wrote a great review in Ad Astra, and I'm sure you can, he can talk about it. Um, she's really, uh, we recently had her on a um, one of our space forums at the National Space Society. You can go to the our YouTube site, and you know, the video will be up there, and you can listen to Lori Garver uh, talk about her experiences with the NSS and with NASA and battling the forces of evil, shall we say. Um, <laughs> so I tip my hat to Lori. But the, the, the point is these people all came out of the National Space Society, and we're trying to nurture a new generation of leaders to take up the torch from them. Very well said, Dale. And I will mention that Laurie Garver has been a guest on This Week in Space and a fantastic guest. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all fans of her and her work and uh, enthusiastically recommend to listeners that they check out that episode. And I also think this would be a great time to just mention that the, the National Space Society very warmly welcomes new members, enthusiasts. We have members from all over the world. And please visit nss.org to learn how you can become part of this great and venerable organization. Over to you, Rod. Well said as always, sir. And Dale, uh, we're going to go to a short break for a message from one of our sponsors. And when we come back, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the core values of the NSS and Gerard O'Neill. So stand by, everybody. And we're back. So, Dale, uh, core values and a little bit about O'Neill, if you would, the sort of the capsule summary. Um, well, look, the, the thing to understand about space, I guess, is sometimes people uh, make spa divide space advocates into three groups. Some called the, the Saganites, people who want to have robots going to the planet. Von Braunians, who want to send uh, sort of big Apollo-type expeditions to other planets. And the O'Neillians. And who are these O'Neillians? Sounds like, a, like an alien race from Capella or something. Um, <laughs> Gerard O'Neill was a uh, a physics professor at Princeton University, and uh, he, in 1974, published a paper in Physics Today, I believe it was called The Colonization of Space, and he put forward the idea that the right place to expand human civilization was not on planets or moons, but in free space, and he outlined a plan uh, for building free space habitats, and at first this sounds like kind of like just so smoking too much weed or something, uh, too much LSD, maybe. I don't know. It was um, the time. It was the time, yeah. And he did wear a turtleneck, so you know that's that's that's. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, but it, the, it, when you look at the science, and that was the, you know, the strength of O'Neill's vision is he looked at the science and he said, well, you know, how do you have Earth-like conditions? Well, you can build a big cylinder and you can rotate it. Well, you can do that. That works. And uh, well, where do we get the mass? And he invented, uh, he re actually refined a thing called the mass driver for launching electromagnetically mass off the moon very cheaply. And he laid in all the details and wrote a book called The High Frontier, which is really the, some call it the Bible of the space movement. And I, it definitely had a lot of influence on me. I, I was influenced by other books. Um, and, and in particular, uh, The Promise of Space by Arthur C. Clarke, which is still pretty relevant. Um, but but it was definitely O'Neill that lit the fire under that started, you know, that, that ignited the L5 society because people suddenly said, wow, the, you know, we could do this. You, you, you can look at that. You read this book and you're like, yeah, why don't we just do it? We used to have a slogan, L5 and 95. The whole idea of the L5 society was to dissolve itself at the L5 points, uh, which, by the way, for those who don't know, uh, there was a mathematician kind of called O'Grange who decided or discovered that in any two body system, there are five points of dynamic stability. That means you put something there. It doesn't like drift away. And uh, hence the L5 is one of the points. There's one on one side of the moon and one on the other side of the moon. 
There's one on the far side of the moon, there's one between the Earth and the moon, and then there's one on the other side of the Earth from the moon. Those are the L5 points. Um, but anyway, you talk about that. So what are our values? I, I think the, the, the kind of fundamental value that we have is that, um, it, the, you know, we, we're, we're sort of pro-human in the sense that we think fundamentally it, humans have enormous potential for good and that the good overwhel- overweighs the bad and a future perhaps not unlike the future in Star Trek is possible and that we just have to grasp it. Um, and it, it, it is as opposed to a philosophy of limits that, that we need to live on the earth, we need to cut back, we need to be poor, we need to live in grass huts and play ukuleles or something. Uh, it's a vision of people living the lives they want to live. If they want to live and play ukuleles, they can. And if they want to build space settlements around Europa, they can do that too. And it's a vision of freedom that people should be able to choose how they want to live and not be part of a homogenized society where we're all sort of uh, dictated to eat the same food, have the same political beliefs, uh, kind of an Orwellian sort of world. Uh, and, and, uh, and anyway, so those are some of the visions, uh, but we, we stand for freedom. We stand for people being in control of their own lives. We stand for openness. We're also an international group. We believe that, uh, we, we really believe space is the province of all humanity, that every human being should have a right to access the resources of space. That's not the same thing as saying that, that everything in space is owned by the earth by humans collectively, which is sort of a, a sort of a folly. But uh, anyway, that gives some ideas. Um, maybe you have some questions. I, I do related to the, the space settlement work, Dale, that I know is, is such an important part of the NSS mission and something that is that is particularly important to you. I know that over the past few years, you've started a long-term project where together with one of our colleagues, you are compiling an archive of, of all known legitimate published articles and research works on the concept of space settlement. Would you care to comment on that project? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, look, the genesis of this is, you know, we, we work with something called the Alliance for Space Development, which is a group of 15 nonprofits that focus on space development and settlement. And uh, the, the, I was actually personally in the room uh, a couple of years ago, and we were meeting with the House Science staff, and we were at that time pitching to include language in the NASA charter saying that space settlement was part of the fundamental reason for the existence of NASA. And uh, the staffers who seem to consist of all of young science PhDs uh, were looking at me and they said, well, can you show us a peer reviewed paper that shows that space settlement is possible? And I was taken aback. I I mean, from the point of view of, of space settlement advocates, this was all settled in 1974. Of course it's possible. But first off, these people in this staff apparently had never heard of Gerard O'Neill, had never read his paper, and it's not clear to me they would have been impressed by it in any case. So I came out of that meeting, and, and then I also realized that there, although there have been thousands of papers on space settlement written since uh, O'Neill's foundational papers, virtually none of them, or apparently, as far as I knew, very few of them appeared in peer-reviewed journals. They appeared in conferences like O'Neill's uh, uh, space manufacturing constant uh, co- or conference that he ran in Princeton for many years, which I had the privilege of attending because I lived in New Jersey. <laughs> um, anyway, so I came out of that and said, you know, we really have to figure out either if there are, if there are no papers, we have to get somebody to write some, and if there are papers, we need to put to, put them together. So we uh, identified a young student, uh, Hannah Renz, um, who you can uh, actually see on our website if you want to listen to the video that she made about her career, uh, which is on NSS.org. Um, and she currently is working on the Boeing Starliner, uh, but she's really young. She's just out of college. And uh, so she worked on this paper one summer when due to COVID, she had a few other options. And the, the paper attempts to survey all peer-reviewed papers <clears throat> that she could find 
that show that different aspects of space settlement are possible. And there's not one paper that shows space settlement is possible, which she found several hundred papers on different aspects of space settlement. And uh, we, <clears throat> we're trying to, we've been trying to get that. It's all done. We've been trying to get it published. We've run into the problem that the paper is too long uh, for most uh, magazines or most journals to accept. It's 45 pages and there are five or six pages just of references. So it it's a it's a substantial work and uh, it's it's been a valuable tool to us, but it you know we we need to get it published and uh, you know make it more more widely available and but again the key point here is and a lot of space on the fall into this it's easy to go to a conference and present a paper or put it on your website and then feel like you did something, but sadly those kind of publications don't get the same respect as an actual peer reviewed publication so we're we're really uh, working hard to get get this published. In fact, you know, this is something I'm involved in. We may actually split it up into multiple papers and add co-authors, and eventually, uh, you will see it. But like all real projects, it's excruciatingly difficult to actually do important things. Well, you're you're making a difference, and and so is Hannah, and I've I've had the pleasure of working with with her too. So, wish you every success with that important ongoing project. Yeah, Hannah's a delight, and Dale, I want to talk a little bit about the changing needs for citizen space advocacy groups in this new space age. A lot of young people I talk to seem to have the idea they're satisfied to kind of sit back and watch Elon Musk build the future. But there's a lot more at stake here, obviously, not the least of which is defending Earth from asteroid and comet impacts. Maybe you could talk about a few of the priorities you have. <clears throat> well, uh, the NSS has sort of four, well, per perhaps I should say, the, it's, it's three fundamental objectives. One is to protect the Earth from asteroids and comets. And I you might ask, well, why is that? Um, why is that one of our our top three objectives? The answer is, if we're all dead, there won't be any space program or space settlement. Also, see above, being dead is a problem, <laughs> and <laughs> that's literally what it's it's literally what's at, at stake here. And and we are rolling a rock up a hill, trying to get Congress and NASA to treat. Uh, incoming asteroids is a real danger. And yet, if you look at at the, the situation in Russia in the early 20th century or the great meteor crater, it, it, if that happened, I mean, my personal fear is that we're going to have an Arizona meteor crater size meteor, which really wasn't that big. It's going to hit a city, maybe not New York or Chicago, but, you know, I don't know, Islamabad or someplace. And somebody's going to decide it's a nuclear attack. And then mm -hmm. that's going to be the end of the world because they'll launch a couple hundred nukes. We'll have a nuclear winter and we'll all be eating rats before long. So <laughs> I, 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 I think that th this is a real issue and I, I feel passionate about it. I, I know uh, you, you gentlemen feel passionate about it. Um, if you go to NSS.org, you'll see that that's our current main campaign. You'll, <laughs> you'll see a giant, giant meteors coming right towards the earth. So please pay attention. Uh, the other two things we're focused on is, oh, yeah, that's great. There it is. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, this is what I say more about this. We're in a very tricky situation. We have a great uh, uh, infrared telescope that's being built. But for some reason, NASA has decided to devastate that program. And uh, they, they basically, they were on a course to shadow cancellation, which is basically you cut the budget so much the team breaks up and nothing ever happens. And... Uh, we, we've kind of pushed back from that. We got the Congress to add back some money in, so I don't think it's quite in the shadow cancellation role. But it's it's just an, it's an unfortunate thing that even though protecting the Earth from asteroids and comets polls is the number one thing American citizens think we ought to be doing in space, it is far from NASA's number one priority. <laughs> it's down there in the weeds somewhere. And, and even though it's mandated by Congress to find 90% of all threatening asteroids, it's not the priority of NASA. So that you, you ask, like, what is space activism today? Well, it's fighting for things like this. Um, so that's the, the personal in the gut thing. And then the, the other things that we're concerned about, we believe that, you know, space settlement will come from space development. And in other words, it's, 
If you don't develop the resources of space, of course, you don't get the benefits to humanity of those resources, which I could talk a lot more about. Um, but it, it, the um, developing those resources is a real uphill battle. It, 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 the goal here is to create sort of a cislunar economy that's as self-sustaining as communication satellites are now, where the NASA budget doesn't matter, and where benefits flow freely, kind of like they do from low Earth orbit, people don't appreciate it's you know the degree to which our lives today are totally benefited by the space program of the past. Weather satellites, communication satellites, global positioning satellites. For heaven's sakes, you can't even have Tinder without space. Tinder is based on the space program, but people don't think about that. They don't think about all the people that would be dead if we didn't have weather satellites. Uh, so that, and there is even more good to come. And one of the things we're focused on is uh, the idea of building uh, solar power satellites in space and providing uh, low cost carbon free energy to everybody on the earth. That's a big thing, a big, big thing. We think that's on the horizon. There's actually a lot of interest in it right now. A lot of a lot of countries are starting to really make a commitment to it, and I could I could elaborate on that. But that's one of our priorities. Over. All right. Well, I I hear that rats go pretty well with cardamom, so I'll bear that in mind. But first, let's take a short break, and we'll be right back. And we're back, Jeffrey. Rats and cardamom. What are vegetarians supposed to eat during the apocalypse, during the nuclear winter? <laughs> you you can have the fur. That's awful. Mm. Okay, thank you. Just the cardamom. I think traditionally in survivalist uh, literature, dandelion tea is is considered a winner. Excellent. Well, I have tried my hand at making dandelion wine on on more than one occasion. It wasn't tremendously successful, but I'll bet we'll you have, have we'll have plenty of time. We'll have plenty of time for that if there's a uh, if there's an apocalypse. <laughs> now, well, just one more good reason to support asteroid defense initiatives. Dale, the National Space Society runs the International Space Development Conference each year, which travels to different cities. Also the Space Settlement Conference. It's a sponsor of the International Space Settlement Design Competition and many other hands-on projects. So joining the NSS is a great way for people who would like to know more about space exploration, space settlement to get involved. What would you say to those potential space enthusiasts about about how the NSS welcomes people from all backgrounds and interests, these people who are potential members, why should they join the National Space Society? Well, first off, <clears throat> let me say that our members consist of all kinds of people. And they're not just, we certainly have space professionals and engineers, that sort of stuff. We have a lot of people who are just interested in space, sort of ordinary citizens who have no technical background. And there's also, I think at this point, a, a broadening interest. We, we actually have a lot of lawyers who are interested in space law. And so whoever you are, whatever, uh, you know, whatever your background, you're welcome at the National Space Society. It's, it's a citizen group. It's not a professional group, although there is certainly you can come to the ISDC, you can meet astronauts and space leaders, but that's not our group. I guess the other thing I'll say is we're not like a fan group. I mean, look, we're all a little fanish, a little bit of the fan in all of us. We like to shake Buzz's hand and that kind of thing. But that's not the, the reason I'm here. I mean, you know, it's, it's not to line up and get astronaut autographs or something. Uh, we're here to make a difference. And I think that's what we can really offer you. You want to have an impact on our future in space. Uh, we are the people that can help you do that. And whether that is through educational, if you want to work with kids, we do, we work with kids. We have, we have the contest, we have the spun debates, we, we have the space age Academy. Do you want to be engaged politically? Uh, we, we have March storm. We have the fall fury, the August home district blitz. We have, if you want to be informed, uh, that's important too. We got the, the, the ad Astra magazine of the excellent ad Astra magazine of which Rod is the Yay. editor. And, um, uh, Jeff is also involved in its publication and, uh, it's really, uh, it really a great magazine. We do a biweekly thing. We call the downlink of information about what NSS is doing, uh, that what the chapters are doing. So I, I, 
Hey, we also have a blog. I, I urge you to go to NSS.org and sign up for the blog. It's free, and you'll see information there, including columns by me. Uh, you can catch my latest column, What is Space Development, uh, which uh, that's – yeah, okay, that's that's about some of the stuff we're doing. Um, but, uh, it, it, you know, it, we, we'll see all our press releases there. You'll see uh, all about what we're doing, and you'll see, uh, you know, all kinds of opinion. Uh, there's also a – a column there called this space available on space history uh so it's uh, it's well worth reading anyway um i hope they Very give well some said. idea yeah it's more of a stale and your your enthusiasm and your commitment as i as i mentioned at the beginning really really shines through when you speak and i would like to second the recommendation that, that listeners and enthusiasts visit the NSS blog, uh, for which Dale has written many excellent articles and of course at astra the magazine of which our esteemed host Rod is editor in chief is one of the perks of membership. It is a beautiful award winning magazine and uh, just one more great reason to join NSS. Over to you, Rod. And now available in print, digital and audio. Just had to throw that in. Uh, Dale, that? you kind of, you, you touched on this earlier about some of the people that have uh, come through the ranks of NSS and moved on to major positions in space policy and you know deputy administrator of nasa which is a very big deal but can you talk a little bit more about the various other benefits for especially young people and i'm thinking of particular ones who may not necessarily be of a technical bent because in this new age we're we're entering there's kind of room for everybody or will be very soon in in space oriented uh, careers look one thing i think that's one reason I would suggest to a student to join the National Space Society is there's a lot going on in space, but it's not necessarily well known to the, if you're just sitting in your dorm room and thinking, gee, I'd like to get involved in space. I want to work in a space company. You maybe have heard of SpaceX and Blue Origin, but there are hundreds of companies that are doing exciting things in space. And uh, being part of the NSS is a way to get connected to that to that world to that community and coming to the isdc you can hear some of uh like at the recent isdc we had um one of the executives from rocket lab talking rocket Lab's a very important company but it's less well known than spacex and there are lots of other companies like that um the the other thing you know we do have a space business plan competition that's open to people of all ages that's uh uh, carried on uh, by you can go look to nss.org and look for uh, either space business plan competition or Rothblatt space business plan competition. I think that's an opportunity. Um, look, I, I, let me make a pitch though to young people in general. So I, I think the big difference between like when I was your age and I'm speaking to you, the ones who are like 25 or whatever right now uh, is when I was your age, honestly, if you want to do space, you can go work for NASA or you could join the NSS or or some similar group, and there really weren't that many other groups, and that was it. I mean, e e there weren't a ton of options, and right now we're in a in a different world. As I say, there are hundreds of companies hiring people to do stuff in space, and they're not just hiring engineers; they're hiring business people, they're hiring lawyers. Uh, somebody somebody empty, you know takes out the trash at those companies. And uh, every one of those jobs is important. Uh, there's an awful lot of people doing welding and things like that at Boca Chica. Uh, they're not all chaps with PhDs. I, I'm pretty confident. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here. And I think you, you could convince yourself that, yeah, I should just go work for Rocket Lab, or SpaceX, or some other company, Planet Labs. Uh, made in space, which is now Redwire. They have a ton of exciting stuff they're doing. And I would even say, if you want to go into space at this point, you're probably better off working for a private company than going to NASA. I, I think the tipping point would, there will be always more, more non-government employees in space than government people is not far off. Um, but I still believe, I believe two things. One is, is that the NSS is a great place to find out about all this in a, in a kind of a personal way. Uh, going to the IC, IDSTC is a wonderful experience. And the other thing is, is having an influence on it 
I think especially if you're interested in space policy, I mean, we ha- if you want to join with us and try to influence space policy, it's a wonderful opportunity to learn how DC works, learn how the law works, learn how legislation works, and to actually work with the people who are creating the world we're all going to live in. And uh, what can I say? I mean, nobody offers that except us. Over. Well, that's fabulous. You've been eloquent as always. I want to thank both you and Jeff. And let's not forget, everyone, you can learn more about the National Space Society at nss.org. There's a lot of stuff at that website, so take your time to peruse it. I want to thank you both for joining me for this conversation about the National Space Society and the future of space exploration development. And Dale, we need to have you back again. Where's the best place for people to follow what Dale Scrand is up to? You're asking me? I am. Probably. Yeah, probably the blog. Subscribe to the blog. NSS blog. Okay. NSS blog. That's that's where I, I my space related writing appears there. So I also appear sometimes in a space review, but I'm tending to publish more and more on the blog. And that's spacereview.com. Jeffrey, you're soon going to be departing for other activities for a bit, but uh, where can we keep abreast of what you're going to be doing, which is very exciting, I might add. Well, thank you, Rod. I, as you know, I am a meteorite professional. I certainly support asteroid defense. I like it when the small meteorites land, not the really big earth destroying ones. <laughs> and you, you can learn more. I am a great supporter of asteroid defense initiatives, as is Dale and, and the NSS. And you can learn more about me and my work at Aerolite Meteorites. That's aerolite.org. Or on social media where I am at Jeff Notkin on most platforms. And I do my own social media and I'm friendly. So uh, send a hello. Well, you are friendly. And if that five ton rock happens to land in the Australian outback, I'll expect you to be the first one there and we can both retire because I want to cut. And uh, you can always spy on me at pilebooks.com or at astromagazine.com. Don't forget to drop us a line at twis at twit.tv. That's twis at twit.tv. TV. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas. Thanks for joining us in this discussion today. It's been fun as always, and if you have anything to say about it, make sure you reach out to us and let us know. We welcome your comments. New, ep- new episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so be sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. Lots of good ones. Vote early, vote often, I always say. Five stars or thumbs up will do nicely. Thank you. You can also head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit, and thanks for your support.